on in. You coming in then? Good morning. What a show we've got lined up for you today. Today's a special one. We've got 1980s music icon Tony Hadley will be here. Yay! He'll be dropping by the house and tucking into a dish of John Dory as well as a beef and ale pie. Superstar chef Judy Jew will be back. Uh, she's cooking more brilliant Korean cooking. And my food adventures are taking me to the Spanish region of Galicia, uh, where I'll be getting inspiration from a dish from a visit to the local mussel farm. And top forager, Alicia Vasey is back as well. Uh, she's back in the house giving us advice of free food you can go out and find in your hedgerows. Frozen food today, I was pretty sure. Uh, and I'll be helping launch this year's Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign and showing you how to make an amazing vegetable lasagna in this week's Little Mask Class. And that's not all, because we're joined by a couple of friends on the show who just happen to be chefs behind the award-winning Orwell's restaurant near Henley. It's the brilliant Ryan and Liam Simpson Trotman. Yeah. Yeah. Are you warm enough, guys? We are indeed, yeah. yeah. You're lying, it's freezing. I can't, I can't, actually, barbecue, I can't yeah. actually feel my feet, to be honest. <laughs> I'm sitting this side today, we're a bit of a windbreaker today. So <laughs> always, I'm always, I'm always I'm in I'm with I'm the butt but no. of the jokes, isn't it, really? So, so, what are you going to be cooking then? What are you going to be doing for us? So, we're going to be doing, we're going to showcase our actual squashes from our garden. So, right. Liam grows right. them, and it's absolutely amazing, isn't it? The, so, it's the, a Marina de Chiaggio, which is a Turk Turpin style. Yes. Really nutty in flavour, very sweet, and it's not a fibrous squash. So to roast on a barbecue is absolutely fantastic. Not that bad to grow, are they, really? No, squashes. They're, they're really well, relatively yeah. low, low yeah. maintenance. Whack really. them in. About, I put mine in about May time. Yeah. Pull them out of September. And the best thing about these is the thick skin, so you can store them in the cellar. So I've got loads in the cellar at the now, moment. Now, as a, as, a, as a chef and as a, a gardener, do you, do you feed yours? A lot of people feed it with beer and bits of pieces. I don't, you know, I leave it, but I've got a friend who yeah. grew one plant on a compost heap and he got 14 squashes. So yeah. look out this year when yeah. we'll be growing a lot on the compost heap. Exactly. You just plant them around it and it yeah. just, they, grow, they go crazy. What makes it special, though, is the fat content. So I bring the, the pork belly along, put that with the squash. Uh, okay, so yeah. <laughs> you know what saying. Yin and yang, there we go. That is your friend. Right, but we're <laughs> kicking things off today with uh, a simple little carrot and coriander soup, which is perfect winter warm as well. And I'm going to serve it with a little soda bread, maybe with some special flour that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. So I've got some milk warming up over here. And what I'm going to do is just take the carrots and thinly slice them, because we're just going to throw those in. No need to peel them. Uh, as a as a, a gardener as well, you'll know. I don't know. You know, a lot of chefs peel carrots. It's it's, it's it's fine, but you know what? When you do wash them, and we actually peel them, and we actually ferment them. So fermented carrot skins are absolutely amazing. But when you when you work hard like that, producing your veg, I've got a, a allotment at the bottom of my garden. It's one of the first things I did when I bought this place. Is the enjoyment you get out of the the to producing it, but. You don't want to throw half it away by peeling it. No. Mm. The smell as well. You know when you pick your fresh carrots and you whack them in your container, you come to your house and you truck, all you can smell is carrots. All you want to do is give it a quick wash and chomp it down. And that crunch, you don't get that in a supermarket. Not even with your wobbly ones. Well, it's, <laughs> well, it's things like <laughs> wobbly ones. It's things like parsnips as well. You know, when you've got great parsnips. Mm. But I often think one of the simplest things to grow in a, in a garden as well, we're going to talk about that through Eat, Eating and Defeating the Campaign a little bit later on the show as well. But uh, if there's any kids watching this, one of the most amazing things you can actually grow very, very simply is radishes. Yeah. yeah. You can actually just yeah. grow all year on a round. tray Fantastic. all year round. And you get the, the radishes grow from little seeds to radishes Five, when you let them weeks? go in the flower, you get the radish pods, don't you? Which yeah. Are the like tadpole pods. They but we've them. learned with radishes as well. Over the years, it's always the French breakfast radish, which is the long one, which is red with the white on the bottom. But now there's fantastic ping pong radishes, amazing. Baby daikon radishes called white icicles. A little yeah. bit of fire to it, but in a salad in the summer, phenomenal. Yeah. It's like been with Titch Marsh over here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but you. But I mean, they are, they are. One thing I noticed as well, more than anything else, is about the moisture content yeah. of veg. When you take it straight out of the ground, it's just absolutely fantastic. So we're just going to make these little carrot and coriander soup. I've just got carrots, I've got milk. No need for any uh, uh, shallots, no need for any garlic. We just put the milk and the carrots in there. Now I'm going to make the soda bread for this. Now, this is really, really simple. <laughs> to make your own bread, I'm going to do it in a little wood-fired oven we've got over here. I've just put another couple of logs on. But for this one, you can do it in a conventional oven. Set the oven about sort of 220, I think, you want for a sort of soda bread, because it's quite a hot, yeah, hot yeah. oven, I think. Something like that. And then what you want to do is, I'm going to use a combination of two different types of flour, like I spoke to you about. We've got in here some white flour, and I've got some of this lovely little wholemeal flour. That's going to go in there. About two-thirds wholemeal, one-third white flour. And then I'm going to use some bicarb soda, about a teaspoon. And then I like to add a little bit of black treacle and golden syrup. Oh, nice. That's for me, really. Just a little bit of colour, a little bit of flavour. You don't have to, 
but just a little bit of black treacle and a little bit of golden syrup. It's purely an option, but I think with the soup it works really well together. But just well, take a look. That's because of the sweetness of the carrot, which is not too sweet, and you've got that lovely... See, I'm always thinking, yeah, really it may, may, not, may not look as if I'm on the ball, but, Write that you know. one down, right? <laughs> so, uh, salt, and then I use some buttermilk. Pour that in, and we're just going to mix that together. Now, this is where I always think, and it's quite important with this, we're going to talk about flour in a minute, and I'm going to introduce you to this amazing gentleman and this amazing mill as well, where this came from. But I think this is where you need to look at recipe, because different flours absorb massively different amounts of liquid. And that can change season Spelled to season. Spell flour, because when you do... Season to season as well. Syrup. But different types of flour you get as well. But just a touch of milk to incorporate this into a nice little bread. You get this amazing colour from the black treacle as well. And then I'm going to just... Not, re not really roll this out, just press it out into a nice little bit of soda bread. But like I said, we're going to find out more about where this amazing flour comes from. So I'm going to head up to uh, Gilchester Organics to speak to Oscar Harding. I can see you up there, Oscar. Are you, you look cold as well as I do. You haven't got really heating in there. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming along uh, and joining us. I find this whole, whole thing fascinating, but particularly your place. Now, so tell us about the history of how it all started. Well, it, it was obviously it wasn't me. It was um, Andrew and Billy. Um, they set it up, you know, 20, 20 something years ago now. Uh, and Andrew converted his farm to organic in the really early 90s. So kind of before it was common or, or, or considered sort of trendy, perhaps. So but farming just cereal crops and selling them can be a bit tricky um, to the old balance sheet. So adding value was what they needed to do. So they set up a, you know, stone uh, stone ground organic flour mill and and had a, you know, didn't have an easy time for the first 10 years. But I guess the rest of us all sort of caught up um, and started to really appreciate the sort of value in the, you know, the nutrition retained within you know, organic uh, grains, especially heritage varieties, so... I want to talk to you about the heritage grains as well, but, I um, mean, you took it over recently. I find the whole project... I know you're nodding your head over there. I, I find the know. whole project with flour absolutely fascinating. It's one of the finest, first ingredients we ever had yeah. uh, in the world. But t tell us about the process that you do there. You still use the stone ground, which which transforms it totally different to, a, to flour that you buy commercially. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, stone, stone milling... The whole grain goes, you know, in the stones and gets uh, and gets milled, and so you kind of retain all of the components of a grain, of which there's a handful. Obviously, the bran is the sort of obvious one in in the whole meal. It's why it's brown, and we've got the brown flakes in it. But the, one of the really important things for for us is uh, the wheat germ, which is where all the sort of nutrition and essential oils are, and that is all retained. So and not just sort of sieved out or separated because it affects shelf life and things. I mean, you'll notice our bags don't have a huge shelf life on them um, compared to some perhaps sort of, you know, supermarket types. So, but that's really down to the, the, the wheat germ that's still in the flour. And that's, you know, all of that contributes to the taste and, uh, you know, and the nutrition. Well, hopefully I'm doing this justice. I'm going to I'm going to we'll talk to you about a little bit what I made over here. But this is the this is the soda bread that I made. I've just portioned it up like that because it's easier to do that while it's still raw. I think the key to this though is don't overwork it. So don't keep kneading it like it's a conventional bread. You don't do any of that. Just bring it all together, lightly press it. You don't even need to use a rolling pin. Just break it all apart like that. So you break it, make it like a uh, like a bit of uh, uh, shortbread. You oh, cut yeah. it into pieces <laughs> like yeah, that. Yeah. And then when you bake it. That wants to go in a hot oven, in a nice hot oven. At home, you're going to do this about 220, something like that. That wants to be in there for about 10 minutes, no more than that. In this wood-fired oven, which is perfect for the mill that you've got, that you're in as well, Oscar, there. But this goes in the wood-fired oven for no more than about sort of five to eight minutes. My, uh, my carrots are over here as well. I'm just going to blend these now, so they're just going to go in a that's blender. A qu that's a quick and easy soup, isn't it? Anyone can make that. Well, I think the key to it, and we're going to talk about them to eat them, to feed them campaign as well, People overcomplicate anything. We're on about chefs with the flowers, but I think you can put you can put garlic in there, you can put shallots, you can do whatever you... I you often say the... that to the chefs in the you... kitchen. You know, you make a soup of fennel, it's just put the fennel in, make a soup of carrot, just put the carrot. Yeah. But you don't need anything else. No, you don't. You, you've just got great ingredients. We're just going to blitz this up. Like that. Just give it a blitz. Mm. 
Sorry about that, Oscar, as well, but that's going to go... It's a bit like the noise you get from your, your mill, I'm assuming, when it's going. Yeah, it's... It's but, really loud in here when it's going. <laughs> I bet it is. So tell me about the grain then, because you, originally it was organic grain. You're looking at different grains. That must differ with the weather that we've been having, because I keep... How, how difficult it is to get the really good quality grain, the base of the product? It's tricky. No, it is tricky. I mean, we, we Gilchester's only mill UK organic grain. And so there is variation from year to year. We can't rely on just, you know, bringing some Canadian or Kazakhstani varieties in that kind of give you high proteins and, and consistency. So a lot of planning goes into what the year ahead is going to look like uh, grain supply wise. And of course, but we, you know, I'm just really lucky that I've kind of got Andrew, the old uh, owner who knows uh, quite a lot about grain. He's actually Dr. Uh, Andrew. He's done a PhD in grain. Oh. A so doctor of that, grain. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the so grain cool. doctor. Yeah, so <laughs> the grain doctor. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that that's kind of really, really handy for us. You know, he he just helps uh, sort of compensate for perhaps the slight lack of experience that me and my team have because it's just it's decades and decades of work to read. Say, so James. I've been, sorry, Oscar. I've been to a, a few mill tours, me and Ryan, back in the day. Yeah. And, you know, as a young chef, you just think, you know, it's flour, it is what it is, they make it, we buy it. But the skill of the master miller to get the perfect bag every time, obviously because of the temperature, where it's grown, obviously how it's grown, but to get level all the time, there's a lot of skill. I can see why we call him Dr. Grain now, Andrew. I understand <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like when we first But you see, I, I, I keep telling... Oscar, I do, I do these... I do cookery classes a lot, and I keep telling everybody about flour. When you're doing bacon, I've been a pastry chef for years, people just see flour. It must, must frustrate yeah. you, because you walk in a supermarket, people just see flour, oh, it's plain flour, I'll just grab that. It, it, there's a massive difference. I've seen the price differential between stuff that's as low as six pence a kilo and mm. the stuff is really oh, yeah. expensive stuff that, you know, the French, what well, they were using, that three quid a kilo. But there is a massive difference to the, the, the end product. No, it's, 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 yeah, it's a huge difference. I mean, like, you know, you can pull into a motorway service station and go to a sort of a restaurant or, uh, you know, you can go somewhere that's got, you know, a star like... Um, like you guys in, in the studio there. So, it, technically, they're both we restaurants. Ate. I like to say that. We haven't got a star. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you, the, the analogy is the same, though, isn't it, really? It is. People yeah. just look at it as food, which is, you know, when you look at the quality of it. So, we're, we're, I'm sure people are going to rave about this because, you know, I, I've been cooking a fair while and this 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 is as good a flour we've ever used on this show as well. I'm going to... The guys are going to take this back home. Definitely. They can have a go with it in the restaurant. But best of luck. Next time I'm in the area, I'm going to come and visit. No, like, these these guys will as well. But hopefully I've done it justice. I've got my beautiful little bit of warm soda bread. Look at that. You break it open. Oh, yeah, look at that. It's nice and hot. Really, really tender as well. Don't it? Like I said, a little bit of salt over the top with some butter and a nice little bit of soup. Hopefully I've done that. Carrot and coriander soup with an amazing bit of homemade sourdough. Easy as that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Oscar. Cheers. Right, well, I would just... Normally with this, I would spread the butter on here, but but this has gone a bit hard, this butter, so you're going to get a wedge off. <laughs> is that all right? Yeah, that's sound. chef style. That's yeah, good. that's that is a chef's way of doing it, though, isn't it? We, we we do... When it's fresh, so with the bread, then you put the butter on like that, it just melts, and it's, there's something special about it. It's like a slice of cheese, isn't it? Yeah. It's just... <laughs> I remember doing that for the first time in front of a commie, and he looked at me and he thought, you're going to have a must heart. be mad. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Crazy. Thank that you. with the soup, oh. dip it in the soup and have a taste of that. But, you know, like I said, it's so simple to make this, but it's all about the quality of the raw material. But I love the idea of putting that little bit of golden syrup back treacle in there. Warm my hands That's, soup. <laughs> That's really good. But this, I've never had the bread with the treacle before. Yeah, it smells confident, doesn't it? It smells good. I, 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 think, I think with the soup and everything else, I think it works really well. And it's, it's not difficult to make, whereas I think to make bread properly, it's, it's actually quite... It's not easy. It needs more butter. <laughs> That's stunning. <laughs> Needs more with it. And it's really fluffy. No, it's not. It's really good. I'm going to nick your idea with that treacle. You fluffy. can cook. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> right, these two will be cooking for us a little bit later. And I'll be joined in the kitchen by former Spando ballet star Tony Hadley, very short of it. Don't go anywhere. It's after the break, I'm off to Spain. It's warmer out there on a booze cruise with a difference. The latest leg of my food adventures. See you in a minute.
Welcome back, and I'll be showing you how to make an amazing vegetarian lasagna in this week's Little Masterclass. A 1980s music icon, Tony Hadley, will be dropping by the kitchen very shortly. OK, it's time for more cooking now. We're back off to Spain for another one of my food adventures. Trust me, it's warmer there than it is here. But this week, I'm in Galicia, where I'm visiting a mussel farm and trying to prepare a dish of my own before the tide comes in. Enjoy this one. So as my journey around this region comes to a close, I'm heading southwest to visit a mussel farm to learn more about this fantastic produce that is so often seen in bars and tapas places all around the city centre. And in actual fact, it's one of my favourite ingredients. So I can't wait to try them. Around 40 miles from Santiago de Compostela are a series of estuaries on the Atlantic coast known as Rias Baixas. It's a very well-known wine region, but I'm told the seafood here is something to behold. In particular, the mussels. A local tour company offers a chance to sample the mussels whilst touring the rafts where they grow served up with the regional wine. Very good. Essentially, a mussels-based booze cruise. Brilliant. Now, an interesting fact, there is a male and a female mussel. Do you know that? One's yellow, one's white. I can't remember which one. A quick Google and I can tell you that the male is the paler one. So there you go. This is quite fascinating, this. You can tell it's big business over here. There are about 3,000 or over 3,000 of these rafts, each containing ropes and ropes of mussels. You can see there, look. Local guide Elvio is here to tell me all Hi. about it. Hello, Hello gentlemen. How are you? So tell me about the area. Why is this so special around here? So this is very perfect for cultivation of shellfish. Is that because you've got a tide? Is the yeah. seawater running? It's seawater. Yeah. Every, everywhere is seawater. Uh, this platform are used for cultivation of three kinds of shellfish mm -hmm. that are mussels, oysters, and the scallops. So tell me about the mussels then. We take the mussels from the rocks. Yeah. We have to change the rope okay. every six months. And how long does it take to produce a mussel like this? On, one, on one year of these and a half. One and a half years. And the same for a scallop? The scallops are about two years okay. to grow up. And I take it with these, you export them all over Spain, all over Europe from here? Yeah, this is more, mostly uh, all the world, too. All over the world from here? Yeah. Uh, but actually, this kind of mussel are not for all the world, they are just for you. Just for, just mean, for just us, for yeah. The thing about this boat is you can eat as much as you want, really. I think that's the key to it. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's interesting, you know, when you, when you do this. And I've travelled all over, certainly all over the UK, looking at mussels and mussel farms. But here the mussels don't grow as big as they do in cold water, but they produce a lovely, beautiful and sweet. They're delicious. It's like your chocolate bar when you go abroad. It's not the same. It is the same, but it's not the same. It's a great way to actually harvest them, though. It's brilliant. I've never seen this before. I've finished all these. Is there any more? With my cruise coming to an end, I'm inspired by the produce I've seen on the Galician coast. And where better to get cooking than right here on this beautiful coastline? Now, this is a fabulous dish in a fabulous location to end on. I'm going to do mussels with chorizo and rice. Now, I've got some bomba rice over here, this beautiful short grain rice, and it's absolutely delicious, this. I've got some mussels from beautiful chorizo. Of course, we've got padron peppers. I've got the red peppers as well, the wood roasted peppers, onions and garlic. So the first thing we do is just chop up our onions. It's quite a rustic little dish, this, really. A little bit of garlic. A good three cloves. I'm amazed how much garlic they use, actually, in Spanish cooking. Nice little bit of olive oil to start with. 
we're going to start frying off our onions and our garlic. Together with chorizo. Now, the two main types of chorizo you can get, really, the dried and the soft one. Whenever I'm cooking, I use this soft one. And a word to look out for is picante, which has got a little bit more spice, more paprika in it. It's going to lend itself really well when this starts to absorb our rice. And then talking to the rice, we're just going to pop that over the top in there. And then the liquor, instead of using wine, I'm going to use a touch of cider. Think of it like a little bit of wine. A little bit goes in the pot, a little bit goes in you. But the main liquor is going to come from a little bit of stock. This is just a classic sort of fish stock. Now, you can buy this stock from the supermarket out here. Or can you use that to flavour our rice? And then I'm just going to put in a touch of this smoked pepper. And I'm going to leave that to stew for about 10 minutes. Now, there's one ingredient that I love out here. Are these piquillo peppers, these wood-roasted peppers. They're so, so good. And, of course, I'm going to use these padron peppers, which you're so familiar with when you fried or deep fried with a little bit of salt on the top. But they can just go in together with the nice peppers. What you're looking for is you don't want it to fry. You're not making, like, the classic paella. This is quite soft. Now, often when you start these cooks, as I did say to the crew, it's going to lead at least 20 minutes. Yeah, 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 we know what we're doing. The tide was 10 metres away 10 minutes ago. I'm going to need a snorkel in a minute. Right, we're nearly there, actually. So we'll put the mussels in. And this is where I think this dish really comes alive, because when mussels are this good, you want them just to open up. A little bit more of this stock. And all we've got really left to do is chop our parsley. As long as you get that nice shot, that's all that matters. See, really, this is what you want. When the muscle starts to open up like this, you get this amazing meat inside. So often, this can be overcooked. But just putting them at the end, you get all this lovely flavour from them. All the while, just keep your eye adding a little bit more stock, if need be, or cider. I'm going to get a little bit of parsley over the top. And then, finally, we have a mouthful of this. That tastes delicious. It tastes absolutely delicious, even more so that we're in this location. And I suppose that's the entire concept of travelling around Spain. You get to taste some amazing food in some amazing locations. That is fantastic. Right, let's get off this rock. So there you have it, my final homage to my time here in the Galician region. Mussels with peppers, chorizo and rice. It's a magical part of the world is Spain. The food is spectacular and the way they simply cook everything, just beautiful. Ryan and Liam will be cooking for us very shortly and top forager Alicia Vasey is going to be dropping by the house a little bit later. But I'll see you after the break. We're going to be serving up a plate of John Dory with leeks inspired from a trip from Spain for the fabulous guest, Tony Hadley. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, Chef Judy Jew will be uh, cooking for us shortly, and the UK's number one forager, Alicia Vasey, will be dropping by the house later on this morning. But first, I'm here with an icon of the 80s music scene whose voice and talent have helped him stay at the top of the tree 
for more than 40 years. It's the brilliant Tony Hadley. Hey, hey. Good to have you on the show. Good to, Good to have you back, actually, as well. Mate, it's great Ching, to Ching, be Ching. back. It's great. Well, I, I know you love your food as well. We talked Too about much. Before. Well, no, I know you, <laughs> because you seriously love your food yeah. as well. You've travelled all over the world. We're going to talk about all the places you visited in terms of the food as well in, later on in the show. But I thought I'd cook with something, something really simple. I thought I'd do a little bit of barbecued leeks. I know one of your favourite fish is John Dory. Love John Dory. So I'm just going to pan fry it with a little bit of lardons, but the dressing is the key that I want to get in a minute. But the leeks, let me just let me show, show you the leeks. All you do with the leeks, really, for this, I like to use these, these tops for stock, but you just take the leeks like that. We'll do probably three. There you go. Take them like that. Take the whole thing. You don't need to put any oil yeah. on it. Straight in the barbecue. Straight on the coals. Wow. So you're going to black it. The skins will go black. We scrape that off, and then you have the leeks underneath. They taste really? unbelievable. Yeah. And they just go I straight on there. I love leeks. I love it. Well, they're going to they're go on there. We're going to do a nice little dressing with some lardons as well. But first of all, I've got to talk to you about your new album because what a career you have. It just For me, it just seems get, it keeps getting more and more fantastic, more better and better and better for you, really. You well, seem like you're in a happy place. The thing place. is, they can't get rid of me. I just want well, to... <laughs> but you love working, oh, yeah, though, yeah, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I love, I love music and I love touring. I mean, I, th I think... I mean, you do meet some artists sometimes, you know, who say, oh, I don't like it anymore. And, well, I've interviewed a lot of people like that yeah. and they've just gone, no, I don't really... Don't and the travelling and, and everything. And the travelling is something that does wear you down after a while, but I love being on stage. The best bit is when you're on stage with the band and, and you know, you, you stand there and the voice is happening, you can hear everything. Yeah. And it's it's really elated. I mean, it really is. And I, am I right in thinking you, you've been solo longer than you have was in Spandau Ballet now? I've been solo since about 1990, I think. So yeah. how, many, how many years? Yeah, you have. You <laughs> that have. Means I'm really <laughs> old. No, it doesn't. It's Sorry. Just, but like I said, you, the great thing about doing that sort of stuff, people never know what you're going to do next. Yeah. And what you're doing next, I, I just think, when I read about this yesterday, I thought, this suits your voice brilliantly as well. Because yeah. this, is, this is like swing with a, with a band and, and that whole thing. Well, it I've suits got the, your voice big time. You've got the I've got the TH band, so yeah, exactly. the Fab TH. I mean, they can play rock, they can play pop, they can do swing. So we've got that with a brass section behind us. Yeah. And, um, I mean, my love of, you know, here we are cooking and how I got into swing music was my mum, when she was preparing Sunday lunch, my dad would always put on... Sinatra, Jack Jones, Ella Fitz, Tony yeah. Bennett, Mel Torme, all, all the all the brilliant greats, and it was a it was a big occasion. And um, when I got into music, my mum always said to me, my mum and dad said, look, you know, I know you love the Pistols and Queen and uh, you know Roxy Music and Bowie, yeah. but check these guys out. Really have a good listen to the way they sing their was that, intonation. Was, was that your dad while you were been in, in Spandau Ballet? Your dad said, if you want to learn. Listen to this. Yeah, well, both my mum and dad, because they said these guys, they read the way they sing and the phrasing and everything is is, is magical. And uh, and also, you know, I just massively got into. So there, I was loving the Sex Pistols, but also loving a bit of swing music as well. You know, <laughs> right? Look, um, I, look, we've got the leaks. I'm just gonna look what's happening over here. You you they blacken. Look. So you blacken the outside, and then yeah, and they're steaming inside. Okay. You can actually. It's not the bacon that's making the noise. They're making the bubbling. You can hear them bubbling really? while they're in, in, in the charcoal. So crispy bacon over here. I'm just going to take my uh, little bit of <clears throat> hazelnuts, pop those through the oven as well. So that, that this is this is. A, I suppose it's difficult to pick songs like this because you've done something similar before, haven't you? Yeah, you I've, did an I've, album I've before. Sort of, I did an album called Passing Strangers. So what we've done with this, we've remastered some of my favourite songs from the Passing Strangers album. Yeah. And recorded some of the swing songs that we performed live, but never we never ever never ever recorded them. And uh, so we've done a compilation, uh, and it, it's coming out on a, on a proper vinyl album. So it's, and yeah, this it's you're good. taking it. You're t this, the album's out what February? February. It's out in February. Then we're on the swing tour in March. We've yeah. uh, from Scotland, uh, Royal Concert Hall, Symphony Hall, Palladium, all around the South End, Cliffs Pavilion. So about 15 shows around the UK, and it, it's just uh, it, there's a, something about singing swing that just it's different from when you're belting out sort of some of the rock stuff. Yeah, it's a it's a different way of singing. Well, we'll show you that because we've got a little clip to play well, you now. Right. But uh, I'm just going to basically take the little John Dory like this and pan fry it with a little bit of salt pepper on the skin. While that's happening, have a listen to the man in action. Some in the sky 
You know how I feel Breeze drifting on by Well, you know how I feel It's a new dawn It's a new day It's a new life For me And I'm feeling Lost it, have you? <laughs> well, yeah, I haven't. I've, I've heard, I heard the mix, but I haven't seen that, so it's kind of quite nice, yeah? It sounds fantastic. Oh, but thank you. Cheers, sounds thank great. You. But... It's such a great song, though. It's but, like, look, I've got the links there. Look, you can see the amount of steam coming off yeah. here. Yeah. But I want to take you right back to how it all started, if you don't mind. We've got yeah, to talk, go on, we've got to yeah. talk about the we've band. Got time. And... <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to talk about the band as well. But I some fascinating stories that I didn't pick up on last time you were here as well. Yeah. Well, didn't you perform with Freddie Mercury once? Wasn't, was that true? <laughs> that is true. I'm one of the few people actually to have gone on. I stage love this with, story. With is it, it is true, though. It's absolutely true. So, Spandau were in Australia. We'd done an Australian tour, and then we were due to go to New Zealand. And for some reason, and I still to this day, I do not know why, but we didn't go to New Zealand. The tour was cancelled. I mean, you know, it was a big. It was going to be a big event. Anyway, so we're like, I'm sitting around thinking, what am I going to do? Oh, I know, Queen are in New Zealand. I'll go and see Freddie and the boys. And so I got on a flight, went to Auckland, uh, went Love straight this. down to the sound check, started, all right, lads, you know, and everything else. And uh, me and Fred went to the bar in a hotel and he said, we should have a little drink. I said, yeah, all right then, <laughs> as you do. And then we, um, we, we sort of chatted away, we're drinking away and everything else. And he said, do you want to come on stage? I said, yeah, all right, OK, Fred. <laughs> so he phones up the rest of the band and so he said, we'd do Jailhouse Rock. He said, do you know the words? I said, no. I said, do you? <laughs> he said, no, not very. So I said, we'll just make it up as we go along. So, unbeknownst to me, I was told that I had to keep a low profile, but the message had not got through. Brilliant. So before I knew it, I was on stage with Fred and the boys, air guitar with Brian, singing with Freddie, making up all the words to Girl Us Rock, which were complete and utter rubbish. And it was, it was just one of the... You know, what a I'm performer, on stage with, with my heroes, and yeah. it was just magical. And, uh, and of course, I, was, I then got the phone call saying, now listen, make sure you keep a low profile. I said, it's a bit difficult, really. I've just been on stage with Freddie and the boys and uh, <laughs> 40,000 people. And then you can imagine what was said on the other exactly. side of the phone. I can just imagine that as well. Only Hadley can do that. <laughs> right, look, I've, just, I've got the dressing on here because uh, uh, I've got some toasted uh, hazelnuts in there. I've got some uh, lardons. We've got some parsley. This is the key to this dressing. So you take... Right. This is unusual bit. This is Spanish, but you take oyster sauce. I love oyster sauce. Oyster sauce. Cool. So we use oyster sauce, sherry vinegar, a little bit of this. So a touch of sherry vinegar, and add a little bit more if you want to later. Mm -hmm. A touch of mustard, like that. So a little bit of, use a touch of mustard. That's going to go in there. But then we just mix that together with salt and some black pepper. And that's the dressing done. So it's warm, like that. I'm going to have a little taste. Don't double dip. I, don't, I, I know, because my mother will be watching it. If I do it like that, a different finger. But no, actually. And then you take this dressing this over the top. Amazing. So that's just, it can be just as a, as a dish as, it, as you want like this with yeah. the leeks. Like that. And then all you do is you take your lovely bit of John Dory on the top. But there you have it, my lovely little John Dory with a nice little bit of barbecue leeks. Oh, that's amazing. And a simple little dressing. That's artistry. <laughs> yeah. Right. I've dived into this one. Oh, You're a nice little very... starter. <laughs> I'm right. very excited. Honestly. It's really this dressing. I think it's it's you know when you when I, I had it in a little tapas bar, and I thought, what is that? There's like a marmy flavour with it. And then when I went in the kitchen, I couldn't understand oyster sauce in Spanish, but they assured me this. 
Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Wow. The hazelnuts are great. I'd, I would, I've never done that, but it tastes... And the John Dory's cooked, you see. Honestly, mate, incredible. <laughs> and the John Dory's cooked. And and it's, it's, only... it's no more than no more than a minute and a half, two minutes, yeah. that's all you want. The leeks, you don't want them overcooked, oh. but you see they're nice and soft. Easy as that. So you're going to stick around. That's your starter. You've got beef pie coming up a little bit later as well. But there we have it. I'm here for the duration. Tony, everybody. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Right. And Judy Jew will be back behind the Berry Hobbs. Uh, that's uh, coming up a little bit later. But now join us again after the break when Ryan and Liam Simpson Trotman will be whipping up one of their trademark recipes. You don't want to miss that one. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, still to come, I'll be whipping up a vegetable lasagna for this week's Mascus and for the Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign. But first, I'm joined in the house by two chefs whose restaurant Orwell's has become a firm favourite on the Oxfordshire food scene. It's the brilliant Ryan and Leon Simpson Trotman. Great to have you back, gentlemen. Always Your a food pleasure. is always amazing. This this looks fantastic as well. Yeah. Looks like you've been growing it yourself as well. Yeah, so we are still in the winter months, so this is something quite special. So this we're gonna be doing a little pork and squash, but not any squash. This is called a marina de Chiagio. Yeah. It's an Italian style squash, bit of a Turk's turban. And I brought this along as well, James, so this is a gift for you. This is a Crown Prince. Yeah, the Crown Beautiful. Prince ones are again, fantastic yeah, as well. Yeah, amazing. They? Really nutty. Again, really fleshy. Not many seeds inside. Yeah. And this will last in a cellar temperature for about six to eight months after you've picked do it. You wanna, do you want to cut yeah. one of those in half so people can I see? Say, it's very important as well to leave the stalk on it because this will dry out and all the nutrients will go back into it. So I'm going to whip yeah. it upside down very quickly. just want to show you how... Where did it... your interest in gardening come from then? Do you know what? As a kid, I never really done it in our garden. I mean, I'm one of four, so in our back garden, we had a dirt track, you know, <laughs> cowboys and Indians fields, so, and we never done nothing. And it wasn't until I left home, I went to Devon, and just grew tomatoes and mowing the sill, and it's ever since then. Right. And then I got offered a nice little patch, and then literally just that. grow, so that's all it is inside. So nice and orange, and it's nice and firm. It's amazing when you grow that yourself, isn't it, really? And, and, and it's, it's, they're it's really brilliant. simple to grow, aren't they? So you'll get, you plant these in May, and usually it takes, obviously, until the fall, which is August, September, yeah. and off one seed. So one of these little seeds will produce on one plant at least, you know, four or five, but this is a small one. Yeah. I've got some in the cellar like this, and they're yeah. special them. So we always roast them, so yeah. over here, Ryan's got it. Yeah, so yeah. this is basically the finished product. So all we do is cook it in a water bath. Yeah. So 90 degrees, around about 25, 35 minutes. With the skin on, you like? With the skin on. Skin on's beautiful. I yeah. didn't think you could eat the skin, but we do, and it's yeah. delicious, so it's all good. <laughs> Unless Alicia tells you not to. But... <laughs> and then we put a bit of thyme, garlic, rosemary, a little bit of vegetable bouillon, which is just a stock cube. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, tiny bit of oil, and that's it, really. Just some rapeseed oil. And it's amazing because, you know, you can buy these water bath stairs in, you know, these home stores now. Yeah. Some big chains sell them. And it's great, but it's very important with vacuum pack packing to know what you're doing. So yeah. make sure you have a sterile environment, wash hands, wash the vegetables. I very important. I think when it comes to sous vide well. and you're doing meats and bits, but it's got to, you've got to be a really bit, bit careful with that. But you've got to, yeah, you've got to understand what you're doing. And also, I mean, for us, we always talk about the vegetables. I get really excited. Liam goes down to the garden. Honestly, I'm not yeah. joking. You go down to the garden. I say, what we got? And he comes up with these big squashes. And I'm like, right, what goes with it? Fat. <laughs> 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 so we've got some lovely pork belly. And I tell you what. So we... tell me about this pork, because this, this yeah. looks amazing, this pork belly. Yeah, it is. It's really nice. It's just, uh, it's, a, it's a local breed. Um, we get it from, we get it from actually Newbury way. Right. Uh, but in fact, it's Windsor, off Windsor, Windsor Park. Windsor Park Estate. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we, we take it, we brine it, which is very important, and then we cook it for a further 36 hours yeah, uh, in, a, in one of these water baths. It's yeah. 60 degrees. So what we get from that, we get this lovely kind of, like, texture still, is still there. Because sometimes when you put it, you can just go too flaky. And there's nothing wrong with that, but... Yeah. For what so we're you looking. you both you both met in Devon, didn't you? That's that's yeah. Where so we so we met in the old days of the internet when the internet was a harmless place to meet. When it was people. a safe, <laughs> when it was it's, a safe it's place. It's all different. So we were both working at Chester. No, so that's... Ryan was working with Simon Hallstone at the Elephants. So Ryan was part of that. Not team a bad place to work. Not a bad place to work at all. He was one of the team. Actually, he headed up the kitchen. He was the head chef him, and when he won the start or his sous chef. Yeah. And I worked for the late great Peter the Savory of Bobby Castle, you which is a five star hotel, and I loved it. I left Liverpool at nineteen. Never yeah. went back since, went straight to Devon and fell in love with the countryside. I thought you were going to say with me. <laughs> and him as well. <laughs> yeah, so we met him online. He said hello, I said hello back. We chatted for about two months. And you know what? 
after 10 years being together, he goes, I never understood a word what you said, Liam, than the first <laughs> two months being together. So over here, we've got in the pan, James, we've got some um, pumpkin seeds. So we're gonna get these nice and caramelized, nice and toasted. Okay. This is gonna go along with our crispy chicken skin. Mm -hmm. And then here we've got some dried sage. So obviously, quite nice chicken and sage work well together. So that's gonna be a carrier of flavor. And then we've got these fabulous, fabulous mushrooms now, to who, bring a lift to the dish. Both of you are chefs. Who, yeah. who made the decision that that's one's gonna go in the kitchen and one's to do front of house? Or was to that decision, or is there that well, decision? Well, it was kind of like... It's back now. Yeah, we're back, we're <laughs> we're back, back together. together. We're reunited. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, it's like, I drink too much wine, so that's why I had to go out the front, because I knew all about the wine. But, um, yeah, I think that was the main thing, but I think your, your charisma out front, Liam, is really good talking with people. So I spent a lot of time over the Christmas in the front of ours, especially Christmas Day last year, I went out and yeah. spoke to the guests, because everyone was a regular, and I loved yeah. it. I loved just, like, Walking around. Well, your restaurant, I, I've had the privilege Sounds to eat so your nice. restaurant as well, but you've, it says here you've, you've just opened a new cocktail lounge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's because I like cocktails. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, that. So we've got that. I remember when you came, James, we had that conservatory, which overlooks the fabulous Oxford countryside. We thought, yeah. you know, well, we don't want to be big covers no more, so we're down to like 20 covers, 25 maximum. And we turned that room into a lounge. I think that's what was missing it all was, because since the dreaded COVID, we got rid of the bar. Yeah. Sitting only, but people like to come and relax, and now yeah, you can yeah, chill. Right. And we've got some fabulous cocktails. Again, what, what's, seasonal what's inspired. What's he doing over there? What's, what's, what's so, happening? Making got, noise. <laughs> because we've got pork, the standard thing to add is usually like apple, that sort of thing. Yeah. But we like to use tamarind instead of apple. Yeah. And basically, we, we, we soak it in water, um, we pass it through a, a fine sieve, it gives us the pulp, and then we emulsify it with a little bit of oil and then just finish it with a bit of salt. It's absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Look, it's like a little mayonnaise almost. So, so that's the oil going in. That's yeah. it, yeah. So almost fire. But we like to use a lot of Asian inspired foods yeah. at the restaurant. Just um, just flavors. Flavors. So you make that tamarind paste, do you? Or... So it comes in a block, you buy from any supermarket, and usually it's a block about yay big. It looks like a, it looks like a saurine loaf. You, you, you soak it. And yeah. you soak it in water, bring it up to a boil and pass it off. I feel like I'm getting louder and louder here. <laughs> I'm doing that purpose. <laughs> I shan't answer any more questions yet, but go on. Yeah. There we go. Well, that's it, just together. That's it, yeah. Right. yeah. So basically what, what you're ended up really with... really nice. You're ended up with... That, Lovely. Yeah, really Which nice. is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So it just emulsifies, finish with a bit of lemon, a little bit of salt, absolutely perfect. OK, so we're going to add a little bit of sage to this, just on the side, and we'll mix it in a minute. And then to finish this off, we're going to use some lardo. So lardo is this thing down the front. So it's always best to keep that in the freezer. Basically, it's cured pork fat. And you always put it on hot food, because when it melts, it creates this li lovely skin that goes translucent. But when you break into it, that on eggs. Have that on your fried eggs Think on about a breakfast. It is. Around Europe, it's phenomenal. This, this, around Europe, this is, this is common. <laughs> Wow, that's a... just a hit. Nice sharp hit. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Around Europe, you'll find this quite a lot. This lardo, but yeah, I mean, look at not that. so much in that. the UK. You you do get it. You'll get it online, really, won't you? But well, yeah. that's that's actually Iberico lardo. So that's a Pata Negra um, lardo. Well, you is, know, I'm in Spain with, with yeah. I've just obviously done this thing in Spain, but you'll you'll find it a lot in Spain, a little bit in France and. In Italy, you'll get lardo. It's just as it is on toast. It's like that. It's just beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, we've had it. Mangalitsa. We've talked about that before, haven't we? Uh, yeah. With great lardo as well. And again, it's just a, another level of richness to the dish. Yeah. You've got the umami from the, you know, from the mushrooms and things like that, and then the sweetness from the the pumpkin. So it is always good. Keep it in your freezer, and if. You know, I dread to think how many people have mandolins at home because when I hear news, when I hear like Radio 2 talking about accidents in the kitchen, people go, oh, the yeah. mandolin sliced my finger yeah. off, I threw it in the bin. But they are good, so we're going to use a knife today just to slice this down. We don't need too much of it because, again, it is very rich and we've got, obviously, we've got the rich chicken skin, we've got the rich pork belly. So I missed what you put in the chicken skin. What would you just do? A bit, just a bit of green. In, oh, sorry. So, so we've got so chicken sage. skin, a tiny little bit of sage, yeah. and then we're going to put some of the seaweed powder in there just to give it a little hit and then finish it with a little bit of this. It's quite interesting. Panda piece, which is gingerbread. We love creating food where it's got levels of flavour, but texture. Textures are very important to us with food because, yeah. you know, we've got a soft squash, a soft pork belly, a soft mushroom. Yeah. It's almost like baby food in chunks here, but we want to have the texture. So we've got the seeds, we've got the chicken skin. And that's the final thing that's going to go into the, the actual crumb, is actually the seeds, right. which is, uh, yeah. Which again is association to the, the squash and the pumpkin. But yeah, I mean, this dish, for me, it's all about flavour, acidity, like Liam said, balance of fat. But this is the sort of thing we do on our tasting menu. 
Right. So this is like showcasing the tasting menu more so. Usually we do like a la carte kind of dishes, but this is definitely what we do, what we love doing, basically. Yeah. So just to plate it up, quite simple. You found gonna... these sexy plates, James. I know, you've been digging, yeah, digging in the cupboards. We've been nicking, your, yeah, yeah. nicking them from the cupboards. So. No, I think we're pretty much done. Yeah. So I let Ryan play some because you know that's what we do yeah, best. Yeah, like, I, like I like to take the glory. <laughs> so we'll do two today. We'll have one, James, because we skip right. breakfast. I could I live a bit thick, Ryan? I do apologise. Yeah, I'm going to sack me. I'm going <laughs> to sack you for that one. It's fine. You begin to tell enough. It's amazing that ladder, though, isn't it? Would yeah. You, even, you even on to sort of just some hot toasted sourdough. Yeah, phenomenal. It's so really so good. delicious. Even over like a little scallop, that sort of thing. It's quite interesting. So there we go, and then we finish it with this. Again, this city tea's coming through. You got so a bit again, of tamarind just, there. As yeah. Well. Just the, obviously we've got in there is the sherry vinegar. Yeah. A little bit of salt, some of the rapeseed oil. And then I just put a few little green bits in there, nothing, nothing too special. That looks, I mean, that, that, that umami hit you get with the tamarind is fantastic, but particularly with this, this chicken skin as well over the top. But it really balances out I the like tamarind. the panda piece there, that's really clever. Yeah, the acidity. Oh, and now we're going to go all... <laughs> fancy, oh, you're going to go all chef. Yes. We're going to go all chef, here we go. Okay. Let's bring a little vibrancy to the dish, a little bit of colour. A little bit of onion flavour going on as well. These little onion shoots. So give us the name of this dish, is it? I presume it's on your menu. Yep, so it's our homegrown marina de Chagia with Windsor Estate pork belly, chicken and pumpkin. Just look at that. It looks Beautiful. fantastic. I reckon it's going to taste fantastic. Ryan and Liam, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to this. Do I take any? Any. Yeah, Anyone? Have I'll grab this one. Go on then. You've got nice and forks there. You dive in. This yeah. looks we amazing. Need your own food. <laughs> hey? Well, we do. It well, not many chefs eat their own food. That's <laughs> yeah. the thing. Yeah, someone said that much once. You've always got to eat your own food to try it. Mm. It's delicious. He must it like is it. Food. It's quiet. Like you said about the skin on the squash, you can make it's delicious, isn't it? And now, like you said about the carrots as well, you don't need to get rid of the skin all the time. Really good. Well. Very clever. I love that dish. Right, my Leon, everybody. <laughs> uh, great dish there. Right, Judy Ju, we're trying to top trump that recipe uh, a little bit later. And I'll be giving you a masterclass in vegetable lasagna. That's coming up very shortly. But join us again after the break when we've got more expert foraging tips from the one and only Alicia Vasey. See you in a bit. This is superb. Superb. Welcome back, and I'm going to be chatting some more to singing star Tony Hadley a little bit later, and I'll be showing you how to make a stunning vegetable lasagna in this week's Little Masterclass. But first, I'm here with these two, Ryan and Liam, and we're about to get another lesson in seasonal super produce from the superstar of the foraging world. It's the brilliant Lissy Vasey. Welcome back. Hello. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Can, can raise a glass. Engaged. Oh, congrats. Oh, yeah. oh, well, I heard about it. Congratulations. Look at the smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so we, I'm going to... We, congratulations. So, Thank what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a wonderful little dish using some of this amazing... Now, I'm going to learn a lot today, because I have to say, when you come on, I think I know a little bit about some of the produce. Which you do? Mm, not this time. This, this, this... I know one... Well, I thought I knew a little bit about one of them, but <laughs> not so much. So, I'm going to do this lovely little bit of... Uh, cod with a nice little bit of garnish that you brought. So I've got some cod with some mussels and some clams. I'm just going to cook these quite simply with a little bit of beurre blanc. But it's all about this produce that you can get now, then. So where do you want to start right. with some of this produce? Let, let's, just, let's just get... It, it's slim pickings at this time of year. It's right. <laughs> it's hard work. Right. When, 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 I, when, I, when I put these ideas forward and then it actually comes to reality of, like, you know, being seasonal, it's really, really hard. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll start off with some rose hips, cos everybody thinks they are... Itchy powder. Itchy powder. Itchy powder. Itchy powder. <laughs> right, oh, when okay. you were in high school. Well, it was right. when you were a kid, that's yeah. right. No, hang on a second, right, yeah. You did that, you stuck it down your brother's shirt, you run off, and did it itch? No. No. You, you got to wallop yeah. it every day. <laughs> you, got, you got to rub it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did, didn't you? And you still run off and you thought, ha-ha, it, it, it doesn't work like that, does it? No, it okay. doesn't work at all like that, actually. It doesn't, it doesn't no. actually, does it? It's no. just an urban myth. It really is. But if you can see here, can you see as I'm so squeezing, all of that? Yeah, yeah. right, like a big spot? <laughs> right? Lovely. If you want to lick that... <laughs> <laughs> Don't be like it. 
She said, don't think you're getting away cos you're having the same cos I picked two juicy ones out for you. There you go. So the bletting, that's the same as what you right, do with the quince. Right, just taste that. that, that sort of so taste thing. the pulp that comes out of it. It's not actually that bad, is it? It's really nice, actually. It's got something going for it. It's tarty. You know, it's totally different thing, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Do I think it's at all? Yeah. Well, so yeah, you, you can do it. It's got some pips in it, right? So you eat the you seeds and all that as well? You, you can do, but the thing is, is to get that pulp out. Right? So you, cause, I mean, it has, it has millions of seeds in it. That's the first time I've tried one of them is it in really? my life, honestly, like that. I've what never done think? that as well. It's really good. It's not, it's not actually that So do you have to... Do, that's just straight off the tree that, like that? That is straight off the tree. If you, if you notice, I was, like, faffing around, cos some of them are rock hard, OK, and they will stay rock hard. But what you can do is you can pop them in the freezer at home. Yeah. So if you get a load of hard ones, and these are dog rows, these are the ones that the birds go for, all right, when they get to this Dog stage. Rose is the one with the pink and white flower. That's quite that's wide, one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the single petals mm -hmm. all the way around. They're really common, right? It's common dog rose. So what you need to do is pick them, and when they're hard, you can pop them in the freezer. Just put them in the freezer for weeks, and then what you'll do is reduce all that down to that pulpy type stuff, which is nice. Then it's easier to get all that out. So what I did was, because sometimes when you look at that, you think it's it's quite hard to visualise what you're going to make out of it. Yeah, right. So so what I did was, so I've made it into some old school, none of this Ultratex rubbish, right? right? Rock hard old ice cream, right? So I've done a rose hip ripple ice cream with some chocolate brownies, and That's I've done off. some yeah. rose hip and coconut flapjacks, mm. and then we've got some rose hip volcano Gentlemen, buns di down di the bottom. Dive in for a little taste of the flapjack and so bit of the little taste the ice cream, cream first. Well. Okay. All right, okay, yeah, get so a bit you, of that. So before we move on to the next one, I read recently there, there was there was a little bit of concern with people in the media and bits and pieces that people were over foraging for bits and pieces. Is that, is that still the case, or is it? Do you know what? Right, okay. So I'm going to just put things into context. Right. So we have a lot of wild garlic around. We were talking about that earlier mm -hmm. with yourself, right? Yeah. And you've seen me before in fields of, you know, like, woodlands full of garlic. All right, if you're going to pick it ten feet front path, that's your own fault, all right? <laughs> and what people do is they get concerned because they can see all this wild garlic. Now, there's a couple of things here. You can pick and pick again. It will come back. But think of it like this. It's a bit of outdoor gardening. If you cut a bush down, it will usually come back better, especially things like yeah. rose hips and especially things like fruit trees. Wild garlic, you know, definitely do a big list of things that are protected which you're not allowed to pick. Wild garlic bulbs is one, so people don't pick the wild garlic bulbs. Yeah. However, if you've got daffodils in your garden, what do you do? You look at the flowers and sometimes you see all your leaves going on manky and yellow and you'll want to mow them over. Oh, no. But you don't because you want all that energy to photosynthesise to put down into roots. Yeah. So if you do clear out a big patch of wild garlic, you're not actually allowing it to regenerate for the next year. So whilst you not might be taking the bulbs out, what you're stopping it from doing is doing its natural thing. So, so when you clear out a patch of wild Sorry. garlic, yeah. what you've got then is dog mercury coming through and the dog mercury will take over eventually from the wild garlic. That's like dark green. It yeah. looks like a nettle yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So the dog mercury... I never knew so that. Right. See? She's that like, gets really annoying, cos when yeah. you're picking it, you, you, it goes... You get a, a box of that stuff in a box of garlic. like an encyclopedia <laughs> on foraging, this lady. <laughs> <laughs> but he's understanding gardening as well. I know? just think uh, it's fantastic what you do. I really, really do. So, we, we talked about this. Tell, tell us about the other two, because this is... I've got one of which... This one, first of all, cos right. this one's in the oven with the, with the piece of cod. Right, OK. Tell me about this. So, we've got Alexander Hearts. So, these used to be a staple in, like, um, kitchens, like, you Victorian times. This you would have virtually every single day. Mm -hmm. They're really easy to use. You've used them in your yeah, restaurant. Yeah, we love using them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and what you do is, like, a 30-second blanche, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So, that's, I mean, yeah. I've just... I've, I'll take, just so I've, yeah, I've, yeah. Got, I've got them in here. Marvellous. So I've, got, I've got mine roasting away with a little See, bit of... See, that'll do. ...butter, touch of lemon juice over the top of the cod. Marvellous. And that's... But they're just so versatile, aren't my they? My one's finished. You just... can do so much with them. Yes. Yeah. So you would barbecue these, possibly, or mm. maybe? Yeah. And char grill them, split them down, char grill them if you're going to have one of those outdoor barbecue moments, if you're mad. And then, um, especially, <laughs> 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 especially at this time of year. And then we've got some sea leeks. So, so these just simply cook like that. Yeah. But there is, before we move on to the sea leeks, yeah. you've got to be quite careful with this, haven't you? Because they look like something. At the moment, right. Different. Yeah, well, look, there's, there's, it's that thing. It's the hemlock factor. OK? You've really got to know your plants. Getting this, I mean, if you look at the leaves, it's not going to be looking like those lacy fronds of like sweet sisley or mm -hmm. hemlock or cow parsley. 
Also, when they're about a metre high as well, they've got a yellow and belly fur, and as a general rule, anything with a yellow and belly fur, which means a flower head on it, yeah. right, is not going to, like, do you in. Yeah, right. White ones, yeah, possibly. What Yellow ones, not really, you know? Right, so I've got a little bit of burr blanc there. I've taken the liquor out of the mussels and the clams. I've just made that with a little bit of white wine, and then I've whisked in the butter, because then I want to talk about what we've got on here. Now, I, I, I don't know where I've been for the last 50 years, but yeah. I've never seen these. Have you not? No. This is, this is a first for me. Yeah. These are what? Wild sea leeks. Right. Wild sea leeks. These, these are not, these are not, let me just say this, this is not an escapee from your garden, OK? Right. These are... Because, <laughs> right. you know, there's quite a lot of things that are, but these are not. All right. These, these are, are amazing, by the way. They... Right, just pass me... If you could just pass yeah. me a couple of those in. Right, and one thing I want to tell you is, you know when you get leeks down at the supermarket, yeah. And the quite, you know, you, you're always scratching around looking for ones with the white bit, which is the sweet bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you look at these, you'll notice that they're actually quite white all the way up. Yeah. Mm. Right. And the reason for that is a lot of time they grow in bracken, so it stops the sunlight getting in, so they don't photosynthesize. So what you have is a very sweet but very strong smelling leek. Have you tasted one raw? No, I, I'm trying. I've just it. smelled it now. It's it's it so more. strong. Go on. We, uh, do you know what? Foraging is amazing. Listen, you won't let me bring horseradish on, so you're going to have to have a munch on that. No. I'll tell you what, foraging is amazing, and people like to do it, like free food, but it, you've got to be very on careful, it. haven't you? They blow your head off, aren't they? Yeah. It's, it's like eating raw, raw garlic, well, raw, it's like... Poof. They're not like meat <laughs> leeks, are they? They're unbelievable, aren't they? Yeah, flavour. They're delicious. Are they better than the three-cornered leek? Yeah. Yeah, they are, much better. Yeah. It's, it's, it's chefs, you think, you think you know a little bit of everything about everything. You don't know anything, don't you? Know, <laughs> until, until you go, you go and see and taste this sort of stuff. Don't I mean, eat that, aren't they? Woo! They're yeah. so, so strong. They're Probably really strong. Good. They're very so, garlicky, aren't they? Mm. Well, actually, it's, you know, they think that, um, you know, like wild crow's garlic, right, originated from this, because, like, they have a really big pink flower on them, all right? And I think that it's like, um, they think that it's a hybrid of these. But this is like a cross between garlic, yeah, leek, onion, it's, it's just... You know, you think it's just going to taste like a leek, but it doesn't, Brilliant. does it? So are these right. native to the UK, then? Yes. I've never... Yeah, this is I've never seen native. those before, then. They're not, they're not easy to come by, even in foraging terms. Right. OK? They're not easy to come by. When you get a patch, again, it's that thing about overpicking. You've got to look after your patch. Ask somebody who has to do this for a living, you've got to go in somewhere and make it look like you've never been. All right? And you have to look, at, look after it. People don't like seeing big places razzed, do they? And are you, are you, oh, that's a very northern thing, is that? <laughs> what does that word just call, what did, for those people who just dismissed that, what did, they, what did he call it? Razzed. Razzed, which means? Demolished. Yeah. Exactly, I love that. <laughs> I love that, I love that. But, but, you know, are you still supplying people all around the world, then? Are you still supplying all these chefs? Do you know, you know what, I, I, I'll, it's, times are very difficult in restaurants right now, yeah. OK? So we've had to reduce right back and it's looking at doing different things with foraging. It's, it's, it's tough, it is tough out there. Well, I think continue doing what you're doing because I absolutely love it. But this hopefully does it justice. Look, we've got a nice little bit oh, yeah, of nice. the little bit of roasted cod with the leeks that I've tasted for the first time. And then just a little bit of oil going around it, and I've got that to go in there with that. And there we have it. Those plates look nice, Jim. They look all right, <laughs> though, doesn't it? A little Christmas <laughs> present to myself. <laughs> and there we have it. <laughs> Dish number one. Hopefully I've done your foraging justice. Thank you. And congratulations. Ooh. Cheek, cheek. <laughs>
Mm. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Mm. Boom. Happy with that? That. I don't know, he's kept got talking. Out talking. <laughs> for tasting. Got <laughs> got the, I got the job. I don't know whether I had the job in the first place, but there we have it. <laughs> Alicia Macy, everybody. Yeah. Spot on. Right, uh, Judy will be cooking for us a little bit later on as well. I'll be serving up some show-stopping beef and ale pie for my guest, Tony Hadley, a little bit later. You happy with that? That's gorgeous. <laughs> it's all right, then, isn't it? Uh, we'll be back here for a little masterclass in veggie lasagna that you don't want to miss. I'll see you after the break. Oh, that's really nice, though. Welcome back. Now we'll be treating singer Tony Hadley to a beef and ale pie very shortly and Chef Judy Jew will be taking over the kitchen duties very shortly. But first, this week marks the launch of the annual Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign here on ITV. We've been a big supporter of the campaign here on the show and it's a brilliant scheme that works with parents, schools and supermarkets to get kids eating more veg. Now, over the last six years, the campaign has got an extra 1.4 billion portions of vegetables onto kids' plates. So it's a great thing. So to kick things off this year's Eat Them to Eat Them campaign, I thought I'd do a little masterclass and show you how to make a little vegetable lasagna. Really simple, first of all, because the great thing about this, once you master this sauce, you can use it for other things as well. So classic little tomato sauce, first of all. It's entirely up to you whether you add garlic to this, but I'm going to do it the normal way. <coughs> we take some garlic, a little bit of oil. I'm going to use some olive oil for this one. It's a good idea to use olive oil. And we use a combination of fresh and tinned tomatoes. So you can take some fresh tomatoes like this. You can just take them off the vine and just pop them into the pan as they are. You can take some puree tomatoes, which I've got over here. They're going to go in. Or you can take some tinned tomatoes and they're going to go in there. It's entirely up to you. But what I would do with this, really, is make plenty of it. That's the great thing about this, because it will keep really well. In the fridge, you're looking at about a week, something like that. If you just allow this to cook gently, this wants to cook for a, a good sort of 30 minutes, just allow it to tick away nicely. And the great thing about that, that can be used for a base for your uh, tomato sauce for lasagna, but it's also a brilliant base for just tomato pasta. It just is fantastic. But what you can do with that, just leave that to tick over to one side. I've got one done. Meanwhile, I'm going to turn this into sort of a lasagna. So the lasagna side of it, I've got some veg over here. The veg, you can grill this or you can barbecue it. And because it's minus six out here, the director thought it'd be a good idea today to sit me outside. Which is perfectly barbecue weather, isn't it, really? <coughs> so that's what I thought we'd do. We'd just get a nice little bit of our aubergine and put those onto the barbecue before they freeze. But look, and my hands but they're going to go on there. Right, little sauce to go with this, this white sauce on the top. Really simple. We take some butter, chop this up a little bit, and then I'm just going to melt this in the pan. Now, classically, I've done this before in a little mask class, and I do this, a classic bechamel is done with this. It's done with onions, bay leaf and cloves. Call it onion clouté. And you add those, or rather you take the onion like this, you stud it with the clove and the bay leaf, and that's what you use to flavour your milk. So you bring the milk to the boil, that infuses into the milk and you can use that for the sauce. This is entirely up to you. If you want to simplify this, just melted butter in a pan, little bit of flour, like that. Now what I like to use, I like to use a whisk for this rather than use a spoon. This stops it from being lumpy. <clears throat> now the reason why I'm doing this, this also is a great sauce, like the tomato, you can use for any vegetables. So if you wanted to do cauliflower cheese, something like that. This is exactly the same sauce. You add the cheese, top it up to the cauliflower. It's another great way to eat veg. But you just take your nice little bit of flour and the butter. Cook this out for only about 30 seconds. Then using a whisk, we then add the milk. Now, like I said, this is usually the one that you've just infused, the classic way of doing it. But for this one, we can simplify it. So keep using the whisk. Just stops any lumps forming in here, a little bit more, like that, <clears throat> just a touch more, and that's your simple little white sauce, nice and easy. There we go, the vegetables, like I said, just nice and easy, over here. The great thing about doing vegetables like this, you don't need to add much oil to it on the barbecue, but <clears throat> like I said, if you're doing this at home, under the grill, where it's nice and warm, then just a drizzle of olive oil or vegetable oil. It's entirely up to you. But 
Let's just add a little bit more liquid into this because we don't want it too thick. That's it. And then some salt and pepper. So, salt and pepper. And we're, oh, we're ready to assemble it, really. It's as simple as that. We're just going to leave that ticking over. Our vegetables are there. <coughs> These are also brilliant, by the way, cold in a nice salad. These are wonderful. A little olive oil, wonderful as well. So, we've got a nice little sauce over here. Now we can start to assemble this up. And for that, I would take some of your classic sauce at the bottom. This is your tomato sauce. And see the colour difference if you cook it for about 20, 30 minutes. It's brilliant. Then we take the vegetables. So a layer of those. I would like to mix and match it, really, rather than just layers. Just put different veg in as you go. So the courgettes, peppers, like that. And then the pasta side of it, I'm using this. I'm using fresh pasta. It's as simple as that. So I'm just going to keep your eye on that. So I like to use a little bit of the fresh pasta. The difference between this and the dried one is this is much quicker to cook. And you can actually just... Well, you can do this with a per, dried one with a pair of scissors, but just make it fit the dish nicely, really. As you're doing that, a little bit more salt and pepper as we're going. There we go. And a layer of the sauce again. You want, I suppose, about three layers of pasta, something like that. So each time you do a layer, you can add things like basil if you wanted to. I mean, even to change things up a bit, things like rocket. If you put a little bit of rocket in there, it just tastes amazing when you cook it. So again, more of the veg. And I don't like the fact that you have to hide vegetables. I don't like that. I like to be able to see them. I think kids really like this type of food, particularly when they start to assemble everything as well. But look, a little bit more of that. Pasta as we go. You want sort of three layers of the pasta, something like that. That'll be fine. A little bit more of the sauce. Over the top. Seasoning. As we go. That. And another layer. So really, you get quite a lot of edge into this as well as you're doing it. Lots of colours, lots of flavours. I've even grilled some carrots, which is brilliant. Just pop that over the top. And then finally, like I said, I'm going to stop with the tomato sauce. We're going to take some more of this pasta over the top. And then we can take our white sauce. So fill it up quite full. And then we can grab our lovely white sauce and we can just drizzle that over the top. This is purely an option. You don't have to do this little white sauce. You can just do another layer of tomatoes if you want, but I think this just adds a nice little bit of colour to it as well. And then the cheese. I mean, I'm going to use a combination of different cheeses, but I'm going to use a little bit mozzarella. You can use parmesan, you can use cheddar. It's entirely up to you. Like I said, this recipe is so versatile. But just a bit of that over the top. And then we've got some mozzarella. So I'm going to break that, because I love the stringiness of mozzarella as well. So pop that on there. <clears throat> and then what you can do is make this and pop it in the fridge if you wanted to. And then when you want to cook it, Take it out of the fridge, or in this temperature, the freezer, outside, and you just pop it in the oven. And it's going to take about 30 minutes to cook. 20, 30 minutes in a conventional oven, about 200 degrees. I've got the old wood-fired oven to keep me warm out here. And this is going to take probably about 8 to 10 minutes in there. So while that goes in, I'm going to leave you to see a nice shot of that bubbling away. And meanwhile, I'm going to get warm.
You see, I really like this because you can use the sauces for other things as well. You don't have to make it just for this, but trust me, a vegetable lasagna, look at this. Straight out of the oven. <laughs> just check that out. It contains tons of vegetables as well, but with that sauce over the top, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of pasta, I think it's lovely. And then we can just take a oh, little wedge out of it. So then take a nice little wedge out of it as well. But I love this. So, so simple and super, super tasty. And there we have it. A little bit of basil with it as well. For a little chefy touch over it as well and a little drizzle of olive oil. And there you have it. My lovely barbecued, roasted or grilled vegetable lasagna. There you have it. If you want any more information on the, the Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign, which is a brilliant campaign, or you just want to get your hands on more recipes for veg, then just go to the website. All the details are on the screen right now. Now, if you're wondering why I'm not wearing an apron, there's a little air gap. I can't tie the strings. Uh, time now for a quick break. Join me again in a couple of minutes when Chef Judy Jew will be here with an amazing recipe of beef. This time, the crew are happy. It's inside. Hey. They're happy. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be making a sensational beef and ale pie for my guest, Tony Hadley, very shortly. But first, I'm here with these two gentlemen, and we're about to enjoy a dish from a chef who's played a massive part in making Korean food as popular as it is right now. It's the brilliant Judy Ju. <laughs> Wonderful to have you back on the show. Thank you for uh, having and me. And this, the smell of this is already amazing. Mm. Uh, I recognise one ingredient. Yes, the gochujang. A couple more other ingredients. <laughs> the kimchi. Uh, and a bit of that ingredient. So yes. what are we going to be doing then? What, where does this come from? We are making a bibimbap. So this is a very traditional and actually one of the most popular dishes coming out of Korea. Wow. Bibim means to mix and bap is rice. So it's a mixed rice dish that has a lot of different elements. It's very healthy. Okay. You're basically eating a rainbow here. And this goes into the ethos that Koreans believe you should have the five flavours, the five textures and the five colours in every single meal. So all your nutrients, food is medicine type stuff here. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm yes. on beef duty, I mean, for the start. You right? are on beef so duty. So this, 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 is, this is a, a, a ribeye rib of beef, but mm -hmm. it's, it's frozen. It's frozen. So we partially freeze it. Um, if you can find a Korean butcher that can thinly, thinly slice it for you, it's called a bulgogi slice, and it's almost like a shabu shabu. And nice. we do this also because there are no knives on the Asian mm -hmm. table, and that's because knives are considered weapons. If you think of like the sound. Do you marinate right? for a long time in advance, or is it kind of like um, a minute dish because it's so Yeah, thin? you can marinate it. Um, I'm going to put some sesame oil here. I've got um, my glasses on because I'm getting to stage where I'm going <laughs> to cut my finger. Nice surgical, <laughs> surgical precision there. Um, yeah. And um, so we're going to marinate it in just some sesame so what oil. So what were you saying about the knives? What are they considered? What? Uh, they're considered weapons, if you think of the samurais. You know, so not like, so we didn't really have guns back then. And so um, you don't have knives on the table. Very, very rude. <laughs> so well, didn't you, just, you just have, so you see scissors <laughs> a lot. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so you'll see scissors cutting up things at the table and you'll see them um, in, in various forms of, of before, but you never cut okay, things on the table. I have seen scissors on the Korean yeah, table, because if the meat's too big, Definitely. you just chop it a little bit. So is this yeah. a street food? What, what is this? What, what, what would this? Is this the first time of year or what is um, this? The, well, the dish itself is for lunch or dinner. Um, I mean, there are many different... Um, theories about the origin of it. It's, have you seen a traditional Korean table with all the different little side dishes? It's called banchan. So you have a center thing and then you have lots of little dishes that everybody shares. So people think that this is actually a lot of different banchan that was put into one dish so it's all the leftovers because the women used to eat last mm -hmm. and so it was a ladies dish because all the men would eat first and the women would just eat all of the leftovers you know so yeah and then so i'm just going to mix this so why the sugar because that's is that for sugar, caramelization the sugar is essential there's always something so i think i got enough here so sure. I, think, I think we're done with that and then i'm going to put you to work on the carrots i think what i'm going to do with this tonight <laughs> 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 exactly. So sugar is always essential. In so there's always a little bit of sweetness. Um, okay. So that's what gives Korean barbecue. It's that like oh, characteristic right, yeah. okay. sweetness. So the sugar's either in the form, or the sweetness either in the form of sugar, which I'm just doing here, or in the form of pears. So a lot of times you'll find oh, wow. like Asian pears in it. And also the caramelization comes from the soy sauce too. Right. 
So, so you want me to put the pan on for you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so you smell that sesame oil, right? Sesame oil, yeah. So I'm going to... So it's about to get hot. Yeah. So t this is the rice bit you're doing first, is it? I'm going to do the rice. So the rice is cooked. Right. And we're going to spoon some here. And usually we serve these in hot stone bowls, actually. So is the idea to, to let it catch, to colour it? Is that what's... Yeah. The, yeah. It's like a, like a, what do they call it? Like a sokarat or something, like a, a toasted rice on, on the okay. bottom. But I, I forgot about this. Oh, everything's so far away, I can't see it. It's all right. Um, there we go. Get this in there. A so ginger that goes into the beef. Into the beef also. Okay. No, no worries. So tell me, about, tell me about the restaurants then, because... Yes. You, 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 you've classically trained, it's got to say. Yes, French I French laundry and, and some amazing fat duck and all this sort yep. of stuff. Yeah, But But not, not, you actually, before that, not as a chef. You worked in something completely different. I was a banker, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I, um, I did five, six years in fixed income derivatives. Was that a good and thing or a bad thing? You know what? I learned a lot. When people say I to you, learned... I was this, you go, ooh. Wow, it's yeah. Like a state agent, ooh. I know, I know. You know what? It was, it was a lot of fun. And it was like the Wolf of Wall Street days. I was working in New York City in headquarters, like... Yeah. Lots of stuff that would never fly now, like never in a million years. It was like before, for yeah, <laughs> totally. Like there was no Me Too, there was no like, you know, all of this like woke stuff. But going what, on. what was you, what was the moment for you then? I just I thought I've had enough. I'm I'm going to be a chef. I mean, yeah, it was. Um, you know, it was it was a number of things. I didn't love fixing derivatives. I didn't find. I don't know. I just didn't find my passion in it. You know, it's just it's just a, a bit of a, a different but you thing. But you take that sort of that that ethos and work ethos. Yes. And you transform that into the business because definitely. You know, most people were content with one restaurant. Yeah. You have now suddenly <laughs> decided that I don't want just one. Right? I want to do one in different places, different countries, different cities yes. all over the world. Yes, exactly. Can you lower that? I'll turn Thank that you. down. That's nice and low for you. Yeah. Okay. So when you were a Thank banker, you. did you exp be exposed to nice food? Yeah, so it was my first foray yeah. into fine dining because, mm -hmm. you know, I never... Before that, I was a student. You just can't afford to eat anything, you know. But Judy was a good banker. <laughs> <laughs> but, your, but your restaurant concept, then. So tell yeah. everybody about your restaurant because so the idea is to then take this concept and take it around yeah. the world. So um, I'm franchising. It's called Soul Bird, and we yeah. specialise in Korean fried chicken and also Korean barbecue chicken. Mm, wow. It's Korean street food. Wow. You can get all, all kinds of yummy Korean oh, things. That's amazing. It's fun as well. How do you, I mean, we've got to concentrate on this, because yeah. this is, you put the bean sprouts in. I put the bean sprouts in. Is the whole idea of this is all just served together? Is that? that it's, yeah. it's all served served together. It's going to be like a, a, a pinwheel at, at the end of the day. This is a really, like, cool concept for, like, a family sitting around. Yeah. I've got the idea of what you're this. trying to, what yeah. you're doing now. Yeah, yeah. there we go. I think and I've got the idea while I've been chopping for this totally. amount of time. And you're going to um, thinly slice a spring Sorry, onion for me. Sorry, that's the bit they haven't done. Sorry about yep. that. Yeah. A spring onion for me. So did, did you decide to bring the Korean kind of flavours because there was not much around in London, maybe? Is that exactly, what it was? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So um, I was very disappointed that there weren't any Korean restaurants. Um, you know, I, I used to have a concept called Jinju before this. But, you know, it was tough because it was an education. This was a long time ago, and people were just comparing... Korean food to Thai food. Yeah, you know, yeah. people didn't know where Korea was on the map at all, really. You know, what was... your family when you go say, look, I want to be a chef more than a banker. <laughs> what did the family say to that? Yeah, so my I, I come from a, a family of doctors, so they were oh. not that happy. I think all parents are like that in the industry, but when they realize how much you enjoy it and how much you put a smile on your face, yeah. they come to accept it. It takes a while, though. It takes a while. At least definitely. 20 years. Definitely. Yes, it does. <laughs> definitely. Could I ask you to cook, first fry one egg? I'm going to fry an egg as just, well. Just fry an egg, yeah. There's a lot going on. Oh, my God, it's heavy. OK, there we go. I'm going to put this here. It's almost like a rice cake on the bottom, that. which is fine. It's lovely, mate. You just yeah, do yeah. 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 Can you imagine this crunch? is going to be lovely. I think that that's enough. Let me just... So every yeah, so like when it comes to like Korean food in the in I was the taught if you did this, the yolk stays in the middle. Really? I wonder yeah. what you were doing. I thought you were waving <laughs> at me, James. No, that's what I was. <laughs> Let me turn this down a bit. But all, all we really knew back in the day is is like goujon. Is it goujon paste? Goujon. That's the. Oh, I always pronounce it, yeah, it wrong. Goujon. Goujon. Is it? Go to Jang. Oh, not to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but we oh, love that. Jang. That stuff is so good. And it's sweet as well, isn't it's it? It's got sweet. that sweet, mm -hmm. not the spicy yeah. one. It does work, you see? Look, bang in the middle. There you go. There you go. So, what's the future then? Uh, are restaurants in every continent? 
I don't know. We'll see. It's a we'll tough see. job, then, it, uh, doing it what is. you're trying to do. It so is. you want another pan? Is that... I'm just going to take that pan and come back to the heat. There you go. Yeah, and then hopefully... Yep, just so I've got the egg. Are, are you more? crispy egg? Are you just... Uh, just crispy a... egg's nice. I just like that, yeah. Right. How do you find running running multiple restaurants all around the globe, though? Because that, so, so that cannot be easy. Yeah, it's it's licensed deal. So we're hooking up with very, very good suppliers and then praying that they do a good job. But that's why I'm travelling a lot. And then well, I haven't found that with it. Chefs, they want, to, they, want in, they want to open in the UK and they want to open in Sydney. I was thinking, you that's get any that's that's yeah. that's tough. Yeah, I'm gonna put this. I would right. not like. So what to do have you that. got now? What's this? I'm gonna put the kimchi on. So kimchi is fermented cabbage. Yeah. Right. And so this is. You got full an allergy with, with shellfish, haven't you? Yeah. So is I can shrimp avoid all that. He'll yeah, avoid the. He'll avoid the. There's some uh, fermented shrimp, salt, salted shrimp in there. Have you had this dish before? Never guys? had oh, it. No, never. No, no, no. Have you had kimchi before? Yeah, yeah. we love yeah. kimchi. Oh, okay. love kimchi. All right, so you're not completely Korean food versions. No. <laughs> it's we very, it's very it trendy, is. isn't it, kimchi? It like, is. Yeah, lots you're of seeing it. There's nowadays who are making it. And yeah, there's and good ones not... and there's bad ones. Aren't exactly. <laughs> I know. There's some that are. There's some that really when you taste it, go. So mm, I don't really like. Yeah, exactly. The one where you go is for one in a supermarket beginning with W, and it is an amazing kimchi. Honestly, it's just so good. It's got a nice level of spice to it as well, which is oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah, you got to make your own though. Never. You know, oh, it's kind of. I always call kimchi like the, the spaghetti sauce of Korea. Like every family, every region has their own version of it, and it's just better when you make it yourself. If you can imagine, like buying a spaghetti sauce in a jar versus just just making it. Yeah. So these are all kimchi snobs. <laughs> so tell me about your fried chicken then. How do you oh. make Korean fried chicken? So fried chicken. Korean fried chicken is very different than regular fried chicken or southern fried chicken. Because they usually. States buttermilk, and you, you don't, don't. No, you... Korean fried chicken. You know, it has a very, very thin, very crispy. It's almost like like a shell. It's been mm -hmm. nicknamed yeah. like eggshell chicken or single ass chicken. It's evolving, so you'll see more dry batters. But originally, it was a wet batter, almost like a fish and chips batter. And um... you're not giving the recipe away because that's, the, that's, <laughs> the, that's, the, that's like... the key to the franchise. It sounds like you know when you have the um, Chinese style of deep fried chicken, when you have like Hong Kong style sweet and sour. And you fry the chicken, and then you put the sauce on separately. It sounds oh, a bit like that because that's okay. got like a fish and chip batter style. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, Unless yep. it's just the British version of chip I think chops. that's the British version. We'll just <laughs> whack everything in back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the idea is to, to put the rice on nice and gently, so it's going to yep. crisp up at the bottom, then slowly cook it yep, underneath. Yeah, slowly cook it underneath, and you get that beautiful crispy bit, which is the part that I used to just wait for when I was a little kid. Um, so let's. Happy with that? Yeah. Let's drain that get... one off. Then we go for the next one. We go for the next one. Exactly. Do a bit of carrot. Mm -mm. So when you have this dish, is this like your ratatouille moment to take us right back to being a child, comforting food that your grandma or your mum's prepared? Or yeah, like that? definitely. I mean, this is a dish of leftovers. You know, you can make this with any type of vegetables mm -hmm. that, that that you have in the um, fridge. You can you can you know really improvise, make it completely seasonal. Which is great. So we've got and, one uh, more ingredient to go on, have we? Yeah, we've got two. We've got well, two. we can well we can just do one. This is the thing. I think which I, one got, you I want? spinach. I got I got room for one. Yeah, spinach? let's let's go spinach. Let's let's do that. Here we go. We need to try soul bear then. Yes, we must a trip come. to London. Definitely. Okay, I'm going to ask you to make a sauce one, Dana. So you tell see, me about the sauce then. What do I, um, what do, I do so with you're this? going to do the gochujang. Everything except for this. So all, all right. of that in there. Yeah. So this is um, the, the gochujang is the fermented chili paste. Yeah. So that's going to go in there, and again, which is, which is amazing. It's Anybody that hasn't really, used this, really, really good it's stuff. And that's where most of the flavor is is going to come from. For so you've got that. Is it the sugar? Yep, bit of sugar, a bit of mirin, sesame oil, and sesame seeds, and then your um, lovely chopped um, spring onions there. Sesame oil, yep. mirin, sesame seeds. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Should be kind of. Kind of like the same consistency as ketchup. All right. Yeah. So that should be. That's good. Kind of, yeah. Ketchup. Yeah. ketchup. There we go. God, we got our. Can we never seen that. So, no, like never. That? Well, with the egg in the middle of the middle. It's right on my street, though, this. Yeah. When that egg yolk breaks, oh, so, so I'll, I'll Egg in the middle. I'll reheat that a little bit. So yeah. That's that bit. Oh, that gochujang is spicy. Mm. That's, That's a hot good. One. You're saying it's spicy. One. <laughs> yeah, that one's a good one. So. Right, fried egg on the top. Fried egg on the top, right in the center. 
Yeah, right. I'll bring this over here yeah, so you can yeah. see it. And then I'm just going to put... Turn that down a little bit. A big here, dollop of this just here on the side. Just like that. And some of those black sesame seeds. Where did they go? There, go. there we go. Just on the top there. Mm -mm. And maybe some of these also on the side. Some you might struggle to do this in a fast food restaurant, <laughs> wouldn't you? This is a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. No, it's. Of course, it mayhem if you ordered this. Exactly. Now, so but, give us the name of this dish. It looks so this is a bibimbap. That's what it is. Yep. Judy, everybody. <laughs> Right, I'll let you mix that up. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'll grab the little bowls for you. Great. I like the gooey egg in the centre. And then you get, like, the crispy rice on the bottom. It is a little bit of everything. Da, 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 da. And this is from all over Korea, is it? It's not... not... Yeah, it's, it's a yeah. dish that's, that's, that's enjoyed everywhere, and you'll find it in different v variations everywhere. Yeah. But in essence, at the core, it is, it is the same. Well, there yeah. you go. Again. Dive into that. Feel free. I feel as though I should have chopsticks to eat this. Yeah, chopsticks, spoon. Oh, definitely. Yeah. In situ, hello. <laughs> and, and if you want some more, so if you want some more sauce, you can you can put some more sauce. You got another yeah. another whack of sauce over there. I would try, but I'm allergic to shrimp, so yeah. I'm gonna pass. Okay. Well, it's just a shame because I've just. I know. It's delicious. It smells delicious. It smells amazing. Okay, so I like the bits of meat, the juicy bits of the. Meat. There we have it. Judy Jew, everybody. Thank you. Brilliant, that. Right, Thank we've still got what, time for one more final course. So join us again after the break when we'll be rustling up a beef and ale pie for all of my guests, including Tony Hadley. See you after the break. It's really clever. <laughs> Welcome back to the last part of the show, sadly. Oh. But I'm back in the kitchen with all my guests. We've got Liam and Ryan. Yay! Alicia, Judy, and the one and only Tony Hadley. Yay! We've got a house full today. We've got a house full. Uh, what better dish to do when we've got a house full? We're going to do a, a, a beef, beef pie. Sounds good. A beef and ale proper, pie. Mm. Proper British. We do it with onions, and we've got some bomber over here, which I should show you as well. So the first thing we do is I'll crank that up, and we've yeah. got our beef. So I've got some shin of beef over here, but what I've done is I've cut this into sort of decent-sized chunks. I often think stewing beef. Mm. Is when you buy it from the supermarket, it's far, far too small. So when you can get it with a whole piece, yeah. uh, it's less money. Yeah, but also, I think we can chop it up yourself, which is a lot better. So a little bit of flour over the top. Right, let's get this oil over in. the top. So you want it cranking, cranking hot. Roll the meat around the flour, and then we'll get the oil in. Yeah, let's go. And then we're going to basically sear that off as well. Now, we talked loads about your solo career. We're going to talk about the tour as well in a minute, but we didn't mention the fact of how Spano Ballet actually founded. It was actually, you, were, you got, it was a school band, wasn't it? Yeah, we were a, a school, Dame Alice Owens, and um, up at, we moved from the Angel Islington of Potter's Bar. And, um, and I've always been a frustrated drummer. I mean, I, I love the drums <laughs> and percussion, you know. And then, um, so I used to go down the music room and practice the drums. Right. And then mm. one day, John Keeble, Steve Norman, Gary Kemp, uh, oh, Michael Ellison, and a couple of girls came in and, and sort of John came up to me and kicked me off the drums. And I was going, go on then, big, big fella. Go on, show me what you made. <laughs> and of course he went, doodle, 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 and I was like, yeah, all right, OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was the end of my drum aspirations. And, and the two girls were the singers for the band. And, um, and I used to go and watch them and so. Nah, no, nah, it's not going to work, it's not going to work. It was actually Steve Norman who said to me, so we're thinking, you know, we, we need a singer for the band. I went, Charlie Big Potato here, you know. I... So were you, were you singing before then or not? So, well, I'd, I'd sung at uh, Pontins holiday camps. Right. So we used to go to Pontins when we were kids. So Steve said, you know, he said, you, looking at me as, as if, you know. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I was a bit weird at school. A yeah. bit, uh, <laughs> bit, bit, uh, bit wayward at school, that's all I'm going to say. And, uh, and I sang something, and he said, oh, wow, you can yeah. sing. So he said, well, come down here tomorrow. And that was the beginning of the band. Wow. Some and people you, might say otherwise, but that's the true here. story. Oh, where, did, where, did the, where did the name come from? 
Well, that was... Uh, could, I mean, everyone's, you know, when you're in a band, you're looking for something, you know, with Duran Duran, Ultravox, yeah. Classics Nouveau, Culture Club. And, it's um, weird. So you want something a bit avant-garde, a bit weird. And it was Rob Elms, who's a uh, radio DJ journalist and stuff. Right. And Berlin's always had that kind of underground, you know, sort of kind of... Oh, it's a bit quite sinister, edgy. but edgy. It's yeah. quite edgy, yeah. Yeah. And he was in a club, went to the gentleman's toilet, and uh, in this dodgy old club, and looked up, as you do, and, uh, and it was graffitied on the walls, Spandau Ballet. And there we go, Spandau Ballet, and that was the start. So you got your inspiration from the men's bogs. From the men's yeah. toilets. In, <laughs> Spanda, in the Spanda area of Should Berlin. Be careful yeah. you tell that story. Listen, I'm a, cla <laughs> I'm a class act, love. Don't worry about but, that. But you can't, you can't have imagined what, what was then about to happen. I mean, wow. you can't, because it, it just went. It went stratospheric. Well, we started as a school band. I mean, the first gigs we did were in front of the kids at school. And then and we, were, we were a punk band, essentially. We, we played the uh, Roxy in Neal Street. We played the Rock Garden in Common Garden. We played Fulham Grand, uh, the ground at Fulham Palace Road. So we were really like a Generation X, Generation yeah, X, yeah, you know, yeah. Billy Idol kind of, fun, real kind of punk band. And eventually we sort of, we nearly split up at one point, but we then became... Uh, we found a synthesizer. It was a Yamaha CS10 on HP because we couldn't afford to buy a whole one. And um, and HP, by the way, do you know what HP? Well, no, they do. So well, they, 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 I was I was reading about this yesterday, and I think <laughs> I remember I remember our family <laughs> renting <laughs> TVs. Yeah, we did. DR. Yeah, uh, used it? to put money in some of. Yeah. I went to my yeah. my nan's. I used to put some pennies in pennies in. <laughs> <laughs> This is bringing back memories, you know? It's good memories. Anyway, look, we got yeah. beef stew cooking away there. The, you cook this for a good couple of hours, two, three hours, something like that. That's going to cook. If you can warm up the mash for me, that would be yeah, great, gents. Yeah, We've taken the beef like that. I've cooled it. We take the bone marrow. You just put it in there. And then what I'm going to do is just using our puff pastry, which we've got in here, I'm going to roll this out. Now, I've double thickness this because this dish is quite big. So I've taken some uh, ready roll puff pastry, which we all butter puff pastry like that, and you roll it all out and then make a little incision like that in there. And then when you lift this off, you place that on the top. This, is this sexy thing with sits the in there. Inside. It's a statement, isn't it? <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the old stargazy pies with the, yeah. the oh, fish coming? Down, isn't it? The fish coming out the top. <laughs> I love all that sort of stuff. I mean, I had one with, like, it was like a, a blackbird's beak sticking out. Yeah, that was, that was the classic. <laughs> that one. And then what we're going to do is going to take our pastry, take the trimmings, and then if you guys can then make me these little circles out of that, yeah, uh, and I'll basically crimp all this. So we want, so right, we've right. got some flour over here, nice and thinly rolled, and then you can make some circles out of it as well. So that's that. So you're here to talk, well, here to, we're here to discuss food as well. You've had that John Dory earlier, yeah, but yeah, we're here John to Dory talk about amazing. the album and the tour because this is, this is the album. You, you brought out something similar a few years back, but this is this is taking it on. So it's, it's, it's taking some of my favourite songs from the old old album, yeah. remastered, and then recorded some of the uh, another few classic songs. Yeah. I mean, because there's only so many songs you can fit on an, a vinyl album. Yeah. On a CD you can put loads, but on a vinyl, yeah, yeah. you can only put so many because otherwise it, it affects the sound. So yeah, it's the first time it's ever been released on vinyl. But like I was saying, you brought the album out, but you're touring as well. You never stop work, you. I mean, we mentioned the fact that you love your job, but you're touring across the UK later yeah. on this year. Yeah, in March, yeah, we start, uh, I think it's the 1st or 2nd of March, yeah, all over the country. And then we're, we're, we're venturing into Italy as well in April, mm. doing some swing music over there. Very cool. So it's kind, it's kind of cool. I mean, I love, I, you know, we were speaking earlier, I, I genuinely love what I do. And, you know, people, you meet people younger than me, and say, oh, I'm retiring, so what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, to do a bit of weeding and play some golf. <laughs> it's, like, you know. it's true, it's true. But... I can't think of anything worse. My, my wife tries to get me to weed things in the garden. I'm like, <laughs> I'll, I'll do anything but not weed. So, so you're not going to be a gardener at his place? <laughs> so, right, look, you take the pie... i be your gardener. <laughs> you take the pie like this, and then what you do is just pop it in the oven. This is taken about... 35, 40 minutes wow. we've got on here. Gorgeous. This is our pie. Stunning. Wow. Coming out Stunning. nice and hot. When she bubbles like that. Yeah, when mm. it bubbling like that. And it, that's the bone marrow cooking away nicely as well. Those bones are really fresh, aren't they? It's important to have fresh bones. I think with this, really, and also what you can do is you can put four or five of these in there, but you get so much moisture from this as well. 
we were just talking about how you would cook this if you wanted it. Yeah, but I actually yeah. just simply just roast this off. I think it's fantastic. Just roast the plate, chef. Uh, uh, we've toast. got four plates, four, four plates. Four just, plates. Just toast, yeah. sourdough, bone marrow, bit of vinegar. Delicious. Yeah, yeah just with that. Bone is nice, yeah. yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. You can put a little chef dollop on there. Unless you're vegetarian. Who's yes. the, who does the chef dollop <laughs> in the restaurant? You do, or? We just dump her on. Liam was vegetarian for a while. Oh, um, really? Well, I convinced him to come back. I'll let you serve <laughs> I'll let you serve it as well, Gordon. Right, let's go. But you've got the crust as well, but... Ooh, oh, look that's, that. a, that's a proper, that. proper pie, isn't it, that? But yeah. you see, what, what when you do with it, with the the uh, the nice little bit of the bone marrow, it keeps it lovely and moist as well, that's the key. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, the, rather than put it all in, you do, people sometimes don't want it, then you can choose another piece, but there we go. I'll pop that on there. It's a proper fam oh, family dish, this, isn't it? Time, this one, then. Sorry? Get it on, chef. It Come is, on. It's just, yeah, he's going, well, he's going all restaurant look. I like that. I like that. He's going to do like I, 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 I need some green <laughs> oil or something. Yeah, exactly. You need, <laughs> exactly. you need some chopped parsley. You're not having any. No, I just, or, or, or some mushy peas now. I just think the Actually, pie... and it's, it's, it's true. Yeah. a bit of mushy peas on the side. But I mentioned the fact that you love your cooking as well. Is there a, is there a staple dish for Mr Hadley at the house? Is the one that you got... That's the that's the staple dish for you. Yeah, well, I do I do love. I mean, I absolutely do love. A pasta, for chef, by the way. Arabiata, you know, loads of chilies. I mean, I'm a chili mad, ah. chili and garlic mad. So that's good. But also sea bass, lovely, lovely bit of fish, just pan fried, like you did with the John Dory and stuff yeah. like. Well, and just simple, yeah. Well, next time you're on here, you're cooking. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm going to sit yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to sit there, and I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll stitch myself right you up. You are there, cooking. Right? Next time you're on here, you are definitely cooking. But there we have it. In the between time, done you, John Dory, oh, and I've done you a nice steak and ale pie. Oh, done. That's amazing. <laughs>